in the room who, you know, a long friend of Wired is like, who's going to tell all about his own particular journey and what he's up to now, um, setting up institutes, infecting people with powerful, uh, the power of music. So please, ladies and gentlemen, big round of applause for Damien E. Thank you. Do you need a little car? No, no, I'm all good. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm Damien. So it was probably about six or seven years ago um, that we first met. And how that happened was I have a, um, a, a life coach, as it were. And I was sat there and she said, I've, I've, seen, this, I've seen this Bright Ideas Trust and I've seen this guy, Tim. You have to get hold of him. And I, and I was like, oh, that sounds good. And I went home and I checked it out. And it was amazing. And I just instantly emailed him and I just said, I don't know how this works, but you have to let me just do something, just be involved because it felt so close to me and my journey. And just watching it grow over the last few years has been amazing. So, but take it back, whew, right back to the beginning. So, uh, so I said to my mum, don't worry, mum, I'm going to be a rock star. And, uh, and, and she was like, brilliant. So how it started, just going back, Tarantino, this stuff. So I grew up in Swansea, not the most affluent of area. Um, and I did my GCSEs and I failed all of them. Yeah, all of them. And so all my friends went off to sixth form and I had to go home and tell my mum, I said, oh, mum, I failed all of my GCSEs. And she said, right, okay, well, it's not a massive problem. You can just resit the entire year which I did. So all my friends went off to sixth form and I had to resit the entire year doing my GCSEs, which was fine, apart from I failed them all a second time. <laughs> so at this point I was thinking, right, failed in education, this is not good. But I, I went home and I did say to my mum, don't worry, I've got a plan. I am gonna be a rock star. I think at this point she probably <coughs> was humoring me and just went, well done. Uh, <laughs> So off I went to the music college, got into a band, band started doing quite well. We got signed to a singles deal, which basically means the band started doing well. And a small independent record label came knocking on the door and said, this sounds really, really good. We'd like to put out one single and see how it works as a kind of tester. We did that, that went really well. And then the big labels came knocking on the door. So it's kind of like a football player where you're playing for Accrington Stanley and then Man United come knocking on the door. Uh, <laughs> ugh. Uh, so yeah, and so we signed to, a, to a, um, a record label with the band. I'm thinking, this is what I, this is more like it. This is what it's all about. And we had A&R. I don't know if anyone's ever seen an A&R person. They're kind of like unicorns or goblins. They don't really exist, but we had one. Uh, and that, that person told us that we were going to be massive. We were going to be the next U2. And I was like, that's good, because that was actually in my plan. So, so I uh, was in the band for a while. And then nothing happened for a while. And I didn't really understand the music industry. I was just a bass player from Swansea who'd failed all his exams, kind of getting a bit of a free ride with a band. And then all of a sudden, we got a phone call from, well, I got a phone call from one of the other band members, but the record label had dropped us off the label. Fail number two, effectively, or three, technically. Um, so at which point I was thinking, right, so I've been dropped off the label. I remember talking to the manager and saying, so what, uh, what happens now? What do we do now? And he said, that's it. And I was like, yeah, no, but like, what, what, what do we do? Do we just, we, we, we've done this, we've got this far, we spent two years in building it. How do we take this to the next level? How do we go and get another record deal? And he said, no, 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 that's it. So I was like, oh, well, that's rubbish. <laughs> so, so then I was thinking, well, I've got no qualifications. I've, I've failed as, in a band. I'm gonna have to get a job. And the drummer said, don't worry, I'll get you a job in the local shampoo factory. I was like, <laughs> at the time I was like, Sold, fantastic, I've got a job. So I went to the local shampoo factory, uh, Wella Balsam, quality shampoo, uh, and my job, my job was I stood and there was a conveyor belt and there was four of us and there was one person at the end. And what someone this end did was they put the shampoo bottles on the conveyor belt and my job was I had to pick up a shampoo bottle and I had to wipe the top and I had to put it down again. No, that was it. That was the entire job. And so basically pick it up. And I was doing this for a while. I was thinking, yeah, it's not particularly a very good job. It's not very stimulating. I wasn't even allowed to put the shampoo bottles into the box. There was some other guy who did that. He didn't trust me with that. So I was like, I don't want to do this for seven years. So I'm like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to go do something else. I don't know what it is, but I'm going to do something else. So I put the shampoo bottle down. 
I polished it first. And then I, <laughs> and then I left and I walked home and I remember thinking, I have no idea what I'm going to do. But as a musician, I have to figure it out because I failed at everything up to this point. So I, from Swansea, I moved to London, which was scary from someone from Swansea. So I didn't last very long in London. And I moved to Guildford. Uh, uh, and in Guildford, there was a brand new music college starting. And I just thought, I, I felt like as a musician, I felt like I'd done really well as a musician, but I felt like I didn't understand the music industry. I didn't have the contacts. So I just thought this is a way that I can, I can meet people, I can network. Uh, I met the most inspirational people. And that is where the Bright Ideas Trust, I think is so amazing that I couldn't have had my journey without the mentors that I had. And I think they are probably the most important thing in your journey to have someone who's supportive and who helps and and even kicks your ass because sometimes sometimes you need someone to put their arm around you but sometimes you need to say no that's not good enough you need to do better than that if you want to achieve the goals that you want to achieve and sometimes it's a message that we all need to hear so so I went to Guildford I did this course and there was two teachers uh, two bass teachers I'm a bass player two bass teachers one of which decided to go snowboarding forever. Uh, so it left one bass teacher and, and so one of the other guys at the college said to me, how would you feel about covering some of the, the lessons? So I was like, I would love that, that'd be amazing. So I took the class for, for a, a couple of days while one of the bass teachers was snowed in. Um, and they said, this is really good. Would you like to carry on as a job? And I was like, would I? I get to make a living from playing bass. That sounds fantastic. I was 19 years old at the time. So I started teaching at this college, uh, which carried on. And the college got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and, and I started to fall in love with the idea of, my, my passion went from the music industry to music education. I loved helping people. I loved mentoring. I loved seeing their journey, probably more so than my own at the time. Um, and I'd love it when you turn on the TV and you'd be like, I taught that guy. And you think, that was kind of me. I did that. So it was all me. Uh, and so, and I loved that journey. And then we got, I was 23 years old and the college had got to the point where it was the biggest college in the country. And there was sort of a few of us that, that managed it and helped build it, but we didn't own it. And I was still driving around in a very clapped out Ford Escort thinking, hmm. So myself and one of the other guys who became my business partner decided to go it alone and set up our own our own version of that college. And we, we said that we're not gonna grow it. We're not gonna get really, really big. We're gonna keep it small and independent and we will never go past 300 students. Anyway, now it's at 6,000. So it got a lot bigger than it was expected because these things grow as you start to build businesses and the word starts to spread and you do a good job, these things grow. So the business started to grow and, and I, just, I just loved it. I loved every day I would go in and I would meet more musicians that just had this stories that they wanted to tell. But it did get to the point where I was doing less teaching, I was doing less sort of work with the students and more time sat in, in meetings with, with solicitors and, and, and going and finding buildings. And at the time it wasn't really for me. And so and it was a lot of politics going from a very small music college through to a fully fledged university where you had uh, partner colleges with universities and, and learning skills councils and funding. And it was a lot of politics that went on with it. And it got to the point where I just thought, do you know what, it's time for the next chapter. So we were starting to fall out as the school was starting to grow. And I said, don't worry guys, I'll go and do something else. I was 30 years old and I just thought, I, I'll, it'll be fine. You know, that kind of positive, like, it'll be fine. I've done this before. <laughs> I remember walking out of the factory and that was fine. Uh, and I drove home and I, I remember getting home and just thinking, what am I gonna do for the rest of my life? Like I literally, yesterday I had a job, today, not so much, less of a job. And so I just, I, I remember getting home, going to one of the rooms, I had like some stuff packed. I turned this box upside down, I had a pad of paper, and I just started writing down things that I could potentially do with my life, which was anything from songwriting, which was a problem because, well, I can't write songs, so. <laughs> and I just kept writing these lists thinking, what can I do, what can I do? I, I couldn't set up another music university because times had changed from when I started it in, you know, in, in 97 through to 2010, which is where I was kind of, I was sort of left and thinking everything is big, you know, the, the music college is called the Brighton Institute of Modern Music or now the British Institute of Modern Music. It's the biggest collective of private music colleges in the whole world. 
So, going, going, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but going head to head with that was, was well, stupid. So I thought, I'll, I'll do something else. So I set up a band because it's very stressful at the time. So I don't know if any of you guys have sold a business, but selling a business is stressful because you spend a lot more time in meetings with solicitors, which is what I was trying to get out of in the first place. Uh, we finally sold the business, we came to an agreement, and, and all of a sudden I was thinking, brilliant, this is fantastic, now pressure is off, I can do something else. The hard part was, what was that going to be? So I started a band with my mates, and I said, I don't know what it's going to be, but we're just going to go out and play some music, because that is what I've always done. I've been a musician, and we, we, we went out, we, we played in a band, and we started getting agents who get us gigs, and the agents started saying, well, what we can do is we can get you lots of gigs, so we... we piled our diary full and then the agent said you haven't got enough time in your diary if only we could get another version of you we could we could sell them as well so I said oh, I've got loads of mates who play in bands I could I could manage this so I started sort of putting these bands together um, but they sort of fell apart so I, I set up a management company which started to kind of manage these bands and so those bands then, I said, what we'll do is we'll just do three, because that's what the agency wants, just three of these bands. And of course, those got full. And then it was like, maybe we'll just, maybe we'll do five, because five's a good number. And then all of a sudden it was eight, and then it was 10, and it was 12, and then 15. And now we've got 30 all around the country. And I've kind of, I've got a team in the office who are amazing, and I, I, I can leave them to it. But a really strange thing happened, and this is what I want to talk about. A really strange thing happened around about a year ago. I got asked to be a consultant back at the first college that I worked at to help out. And my job was to go in and deal with all the marketing and, and, and building and the advertising. And I realized that due to technology and due to society we live in, the rules had changed from when I started. So when we first started, we thought we need to get hold of musicians who want to learn. Guitarist magazine, that's it. That's all you need. And that was all we needed. A full, paid ad, a full page advert in Guitarist magazine meant we would get inquiries, which would mean we'd be able to sell the course. It was back in a day where you'd open the yellow pages and you'd say, I need a plumber. And you open the yellow pages and you go, AA plumbing, fine can you come and fix my toilet? And they say, yes. And I go, great. And that would be simplicity. Nowadays, you've got check a trade, you've got, they've got to have 300 different testimonials. All of a sudden, Yellow Pages is gone, and all of a sudden, it's social media is, is taken over. And I learned, I learned very quickly, about a year ago, that I'd avoided social media, and I'd always seen social media as a department in a business. And I remember seven years ago, I came to London to have a meeting with my friend and she had a new job. And she said, you've got to come and celebrate, I've got a new job. And I was like, yeah, brilliant. And I went to London, I said, what's your new job? And she said, I sit on Facebook all day. And I was like, hang on, what? That's not a job. And she was like, yeah, 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 it's brilliant. It's really important. And I was like, no, it's not. No, you sit on Facebook, it's rubbish. And she was like, no, no, it's really important. She said, you will see, it will grow, you'll see. And then two years later, I went from Facebook into social media, and I was like, yeah, but you don't really work. You just ass around on social media. Uh, and then about three or four years after that, I met up with her to apologize, buy a dinner, and say, I'm so sorry. I should have listened to you. Because social media, all of a sudden, when it comes to building a brand, it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a department. It wasn't a thing. It was the thing. It was the way, all of a sudden, that we communicate, that we engage with people. It was the way that you can spread the word, and it's the way that you can storytell better than any other way that there is. So whereas we used to storytell in a very different way, because we'd have adverts and TV and stuff, nowadays, we have to tell a story. Whether you're in a band, whether you're a brand, whether you're a business, all of a sudden, people want to see the journey just as much as they want to see the end product. So, so. I became obsessed because a year ago, I didn't have any social media. Well, I did have social media. I got rid of Facebook because I was, I was one of the cool kids. So I got rid of Facebook and I sort of had a Twitter, but I never used it. I had a YouTube, which had literally nothing on it at all. But all I didn't really understand Instagram, but I did have Snapchat. And there was one reason why I had Snapchat. And that was because in the band I was in, what we would do while we were bored waiting to play was we would take pictures of each other and then we would draw just, well, dicks on each other's heads and then send it back to each other in a hilarious way. And that was my social media knowledge at the time. So I thought, wow, I've got to learn this stuff. So I've spent the last year just 
immersing myself in how you can build a brand in social media, how you can storytell in social media, because all of a sudden social media now is still thought of as a small aspect or a part aspect, just like marketing is thought of as a, an aspect. But I don't see it like that anymore. I see it as the rules, and, and, and I say this a lot, but I don't see, I've got a big thing about rules at the moment. And I think we've, we've had a, a very long period where people have been writing books about breaking the rules, and here's the rule, and you can break the rule. And I'm thinking, we're, we're in a different time. 2017, those rules have gone. So some examples, for example, is if you're a musician, you make a, an album, and you guys buy albums, or you, or you have at some point, when you buy an album, how many songs are on an album? About 12. Now, the reason for that is because back in the day, which was a Wednesday, when you bought an album from Woolworths, as well as the pick and mix, you'd buy vinyl. And on the vinyl, that would hold 22 minutes on one side and 22 minutes on the other side. So about 45 minutes. Songs are about three minutes. You fit about 12 songs on an album. And then the album went to a CD. Now, a CD holds 74 minutes. So you go, ooh, I could probably fit 20 songs on a CD. So how many bands, how many songs do bands put on a CD? 12. So you go, oh, okay. And now move it on to now. Music is, is in the air. It's, it's the everywhere. It's free. There's, you, you don't buy CDs unless you buy merchandise. Music is free. You can do anything you want. Literally, it's just on your phone. It's in the air. You can download it. You, you, nothing. You can do whatever you want with it. How many songs the bands put on, on, on an album? 12. <laughs> like, why? You can do anything. We are now in a rule, and it's the same thing. I, I'm obsessed with all these tiny little rules that aren't there anymore. Oh, we have to have a meeting. Okay, uh, I've got 12 o'clock, I've got one o'clock, I've got two o'clock, I've got three o'clock. Why can't it be 18 minutes past three until 32 minutes past four? Because we have technology nowadays, and the technology will tell us what to do. And we, we are still living by the hour instead of living by the minute. You know, there's so many things. The, the idea of when you go to work, well, I have to work from my desk. Well, you did when you had a desktop and you had a, a phone which was corded. Well, now we have a mobile phone which does everything in the entire world. I can literally work now whilst talking to you. So, but what do I do? No, I just go and sit at my desk in my office. Like the rules that we have all kind of been brought up with, they're not there to be broken anymore. They've just literally gone. They literally aren't there anymore. And social media is, is a massive part of that because of the technology that we have and also because society now lives its life via that sort of social media aspect. So I think, as you can see, I have, I have Al over here on, on video and Sarah at the back. So now what I do is my job as it were, as I want to, my aspiration, we were talking about um, sort of the future, my aspiration is I want to be the number one music educator in the world. That's what I want. I want people to go, ooh, music industry guy. You know, social media as well, but I want to be the music industry guy that everybody knows. So in order to do that, I have to tell my story. So, and it, and it has to be consistent. So what people do with social media is they will put something out. Again, going back to the band an analogy, what happens is people will make a record, they'll make an album, and they'll say, I made an album, who wants to buy my album? And we go, oh, um, no, not really. Whereas if you look at the way they should do it, is they should start telling the story before they've even started writing the first song and saying, I am about to write an album and I'm excited, and these are my emotions because we all live and thrive off emotions. And so therefore, we start saying, I'm really excited about this riff that I've got, or this lyric, or this song title. And all of us go, ooh, excited, that sounds quite good. What, what's it about? And we say, oh, well, the song's about this. And you go, oh, oh okay, I could. And then you say, oh, and, and next week, I'm, I'm gonna be in the studio recording that song. And you go, oh, that's, that's really, really exciting. They're coming with you on the journey until all of a sudden you get to the end and go, journey, 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 journey. Now who wants to buy my album? And everyone says, absolutely, because I am emotionally involved in your story. And that's the power of where I see social media. I see it as changing all of the rules so you guys are now in charge. And what it means is, if you have the audience, then you win. Because whether it's an album and you've got, you know, 
you know, we talk about music quite a lot, and, and when it comes to an album, if you've got 10,000 people on your Facebook who genuinely love what you do and engage with you and will buy an album, then if you want to put it out in CD format or DVD or on iTunes or whatever it is, if it costs a tenner and you've got 10,000 people willing to actually buy into that album, well, it's £100,000. So all of a sudden you think, well, hang on a minute, I can fund the entire band just from 10,000 people because I've built up the audience. And we're now living in a time where you don't have to conform. As long as the audience says they will follow what you do, as long as it works, and they'll say, I'll buy into your journey, I'll buy into your music, I'll buy into your business, then you don't need to have this idea of, of advertising to a million people. You can advertise to 50 people. And I, I personally think that Facebook is the best advertising in the world, and we were talking about this. But the reason is that people don't use it as much is because it does take time to learn. But it's the most direct advertising tool that you can possibly get. So if you're a band and you're into prog rock, then you're a bit weird because no one likes that. But <laughs> once a year, <laughs> so once a year, there's a festival in North Wales where 10,000 really lovely people go to. <laughs> <laughs> go, to, go to a festival to watch prog rock and all the prog rock bands get together and everyone's in one place. So prog rock bands need to say, well, I'm going to advertise for those three days in a 10 mile radius of that festival to men between the age of 30 and 50 who like King Crimson and Yes. That's how specific is that? Whereas you used to have to just say, I'll advertise in Sound on Sound, or I'll advertise in Kerrang, or I'll advertise in Q. And the 3% of people who are reading the magazine who like prog might actually get involved. Whereas now you say, no, no, I only need, I'm putting a tenor in, it's going to pu push me to 1,500 people. So those 1,500 people just need to be the right 1,500 people. Rather than advertising to a million, putting a tenor in, you're still only going to hit 1,500 but all of a sudden you're getting the right people. So my message in finishing, my message is social media isn't a thing. It's the thing. It's the way that we, you know, we build our brands because we can tell our story. And yes, there's loads of other aspects, but I urge you to spend a little bit of time every day on understanding the new rules or lack of rules that social media have brought us as business owners because of how much power that we have for nothing, that we've, that we've never had before. We've never had this power. We've never had this ability to be able to hit the right people with our message so instantly and therefore sell directly to clients without middlemen, without everything else. So you are completely in control, which does take away any excuses. But at the same point, you are now in control. So I urge you every single day to work on a little bit of aspects with social media. And if you are introverted, then you don't have to do videos. I don't mind being on video, it doesn't bother me. However, I'm not very good at writing because the last book I read was Fantastic Mr. Fox. So therefore, I don't do too much in the way of writing, but there are plenty of social media platforms that you can get on, like Medium, Twitter is amazing, and every social media platform fulfills something different. So rather than trying to, with your business, rather than trying to get on all of the social media platforms and just what I call push media, me, 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 which is what people do, they say, oh, I'm in a band, yeah, here's my single, here's my album, come and see me on a gig. And what they're actually saying is, when they do that, is saying, do you know what, why don't you come away from where you're sitting, away from what you're doing, come to this venue and pay five pounds, and for that, you get to see me. You think, well, that's not, that's not value. And your job is to bring value, and the way you do that is you figure out which social media platform suits your skill set and your brand. And so the, the pictures that we saw before, are like the imagery, it tells a story. The imagery makes you just go, wow, that is fantastic. So all of a sudden, you're gonna be looking at Instagram and Twitter, because Twitter's great for pictures, and those two things tell stories and allow people to go, oh, I love looking at good food. Mm. So therefore, Perfect. However, for someone else who's an accountant, building an accountancy firm, they're going to think, well, pictures, not so much. You've got words, you've got podcasts, you've got video, you've got so many different ways that you can actually get involved and just build your audience. And even if you build your audience on Snapchat or Twitter or Instagram, you just need that audience on one platform and you will absolutely win.
So that's what I would like to do. But thank you very much for having me. It's just a big pleasure. <laughs> Crazy, crazy puppy, and um, you mentioned about telling a story on social media, and I've tried that. The problem I've got is no one's listening. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've got a video on YouTube it has been watched maybe 34 times. Yeah. I know I've watched it 30 times. So <laughs> before I've watched it. So it's one thing putting it there. Yeah. But how do you actually come get people to actually come and listen to your story? Mm. So good question, and it's all about distribution. And this is um, this is the push media where people put things out and say, why aren't why aren't people listening? And so social media is social. So it's all about building relationships. And a lot of the time, one thing that I would suggest is starting off one-to-one -one rather than just throwing it in the air and seeing, seeing who looks. So, and the way you do that is very, very simple. You go and find someone and you just say, hi. And you start with a conversation with one person that you think will bring value. I mean, again, value is the word I would use all the time. And I would actually say to them, hi, I've seen your stuff, whatever it is you do. I've seen your stuff. I really think this video will bring you value. I'd love to talk to you about it. Tell me what you think. So we're, we're, we're thinking of the power of one mm. as opposed to thinking of the power of everybody. And so it only takes that one person to go, actually, that's really helpful. And you start a relationship with them. Just, just I mean, we haven't talked for a while, mm. but at the same point, we've known each other for many Correct. years. Correct. And I feel like I can just t t tweet you yep. and just say, Tim, do me a favor. Yep. And so, you know, that power of one is the most important thing. So rather than putting it out there, it's the distribution. So for example, actually tagging people and actually mentioning it to people and showing people. And the other thing you can do then is you can start to look at boosting it to the right demographics, which, which would be a part of it. But there's always going to be gaps. So a big thing that I would look at is I would look at, it's now almost a perfect system from, from when you start to when you finish. And all you've got to do is say, it's falling down here. It used to be you know, cost per lead, cost per sale. Mm -hmm. And you'd say, well, well, I get them to the lead stage and then I'm not actually getting to the sales yeah. stage. And then you say, well, okay, well, there, there's the problem. Yeah. That's the problem that we need to solve. It's a very similar thing. But I would always start with that power of one person because it, it only takes that one person, A, to start sharing it, but they need to be part of the emotional journey rather than just seeing something. I think people put a lot of emphasis on the wrong metrics, which are numbers. Mm. So all of a sudden they're like, how many Twitter followers have you got? How many YouTube followers? It doesn't matter. What matters in business is what's the money coming in at the end of the day? What's the profit? And if a thousand people see it and one person likes it, but the other 999 people buy it, I'm not too fussed on the numbers. So I think what's really important is, is, is the building things from a one, almost building the relationships from a one-to-one -one point of view, and also using the social media um, platform that works for you. So you might find you put it out on YouTube and that's not right, the right platform. Every, every social media platform has its own house rules. So if you try and play YouTube with Facebook rules, you fail. If you try and play YouTube by YouTube's rules, you win every time. But YouTube's rules are, you have to learn them. You know, how long are you going to put videos out for? What's the value for other people? Is it going to be consistent? You might find that you have to make 50 videos before that video that you're talking about, which is the win, makes people go, this guy's amazing. It just took, took that much time. Mm. Does that make sense? I think the great thing, and please, anyone on the panel jump in, is to think about... Uh, the video content as the end of a conversation because you've got to start the conversation mm. with somebody else maybe somewhere else to get them to that particular point because the, the kevin costner way of doing marketing build it and they will come doesn't it doesn't exist. work yeah it, doesn't, it just doesn't work the days when if you built a website and everyone was blown away by the website are gone they, there's billions of these mm. things it, it's it, it's so huge now they're even talking about how do we shut down the capacity, well, if you're Donald Trump, you think you can shut down the internet, but that's another question, <laughs> totally. So, so this, what I'd say with you is, you've built a video, fantastic, now take a step back and see how you can get people to the video. You've got to point them in that direction. Mm. So some simple things around tagging the video, as was mentioned, in the description bar underneath it, make sure it's there. Create a channel, call it the channel that's focused on what the content of the video is. So if I do random searches, I can find it. But then use the other social media platforms the direct conversations that Demo clearly talks about to say, well, I've got this thing that talks about this, you should go here. So your Twitter, you can use links on that 
And the beauty of all the other social media platforms is that you can use the, the horrible word that scares most people, but is really powerful, analytics, to see who clicked it, how many people did it, and where did they come from, and where did they go to. So you just start to learn from that. <coughs> but you've got to just see the, 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 the video as not the success, but it's the end point of the conversation. You have to do something beforehand to get people to that particular point in time. One last bit as well. One thing I would do is I would do market research on the video. So I wouldn't go to friends and family, but I would go to me, yep. send me the video, and just say, what do you think of the video? Because it might be that the video is not right. Because there, are, there might be five million other videos do the same job, and it might just be that it needs to be a tweak. Social media is all about creativity. You know, when things go viral, it's pretty much yeah. the, the more creative it is, yeah. the, the more it is. So that could be just the market research to find out is the video right and what do people think of it? Yeah. May I just, what kind of, so what kind of business is yours? Um, I, I provide um, 24 hours a day printing. Printing, okay. And what platforms are you on? Um, I'm on a, a lot, but I hardly ever do anything. So I've got a video from two, three years ago. And every couple of months I sit down and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> So you like the video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you buy from yourself as well? Um, <laughs> I would. Sorry. Um, I'd probably. Do you understand the idea of hashtags? No. Okay. So I would probably start there, and um, obviously research um, similar companies uh, on uh, on social media. But I would probably start. I don't know what best platform could be for that, but start with one yeah. understand it. Because I did the mistake of trying to learn them all at the yeah. same time. It's hard. Uh, it, it's, it's hard. And, mm. um, but definitely choose the platform. I, I, you that's the key. With that, Facebook. That's the key. But I'd also ask, well, where, when you look up your printing, whether you're local or national, I don't know, but when you look up your printing on Google, are you on page five? Because only page one. That's SEO. You mm -hmm. know, so what are you doing about SEO? What can you do? What are your meta types? What are the keywords? Maybe it's, it's 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 my SEO is pretty good, so if I do um, 24 hour printing in London, I come with Okay. You should you should be able to SEO that into YouTube. Yeah. So if you've done that, YouTube is YouTube first and foremost is a search engine. So if you can SEO it into Google and Google and YouTube are owned by the same guy, uh, so you you can SEO your way up into YouTube. Um, there's a really good app um, called uh, Tube Buddy which is very, very good for helping you understand what page you're ranking on, um, uh, experimenting with meta tags, with keywords, descriptions, but little things like the title, the meta tag, and the first three lines of a description, all those three link together. So little details like that, and that's why I wouldn't be on many platforms. If you wanna be on YouTube, you've gotta learn the, got the rules for YouTube, and it's, there's a lot of them. Um, <clears throat> as an exercise the other day, I sort of went through chart of accounts and uh, my expenses and I was like, look, like, it's got to be some money to be saved here. Kind of like went through and I was like, okay, can't be that one, that's essential. And went through and I was like, can't be that one, can't be that one. And basically got to the bottom of the list and I was like, yeah, there's nothing to cut. Um, I know there is. Um, do you have any sort of like tried and tested rules or strategies for just like killing the killing off those sort of like sacred cows, as it were, when it comes to cost? You don't have to cut any particular thing out. If you think that if you can take off two or three percent of each of those things, it's going to make a big difference to the bottom line. So, if for instance your audit is costing you six hundred quid or a thousand quid. For your audit of your company and you can get it for 800 quid or 900 quid do it or if your cleaning company whatever your office cleaning company is coming in you say could you actually i'm actually doing a review and i'd like you to re-quote for the service so cut the two or three percent all the way through and get everybody to provide you with the service to say actually i'm doing mm -hmm. a review can you re-quote come back to me. So you're not going to say, I'm going to cut that up and I'm going to do that. Because most of the time, it is important stuff that you're spending your money on. But cut down those costs. Mm. That, that's that's good. Advice. I'm going to do that. Yeah, it, 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 the, the common theme is you've got to continue to have conversations. And at the moment, lots of people have conversations with themselves watching the video 30 times or whatever it is. But the reality, you're looking through this and it's hard sometimes to be independent. 
I guarantee if you gave it to John or Les to have a look over, they may come up with different suggestions around how you make because they're slightly um, detached from the conversation. The only other thing I would say though, because that's one way to look at it, it may be that the other way to look at it is how do I generate more revenue? Because yeah. essentially, if you find at the end of it your costs are essential and you can't move them, the other side of the coin is how do I make more money? Therefore, how do I do more around my sales activity, which actually might mean you have to spend more money because if there's marketing or other things you have to do, but it's about what's the return on that investment that I'm going to do to help that get up there in terms of the sales side of my business. So therefore, I'm not so concerned, although you should always be concerned with your cost, but I'm not so worried about cutting the cost because I'm making more money over it. Usually people think about cutting costs when they want to increase the profit yeah. that they have within their business. And that tends to the first point for us is about how do we get more customers to understand what you do. Um, and anybody who ever needs any video production, go and see i6 Media for a conversation. But do you see where I'm coming from? There's, yeah. there's two ways to look at it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, stuff like if you're a small company, stuff you have to do every year, ask for quotes. So your insurance, uh, your liability, your, your bond insurance, whatever yeah. you have. Um, it adds up a lot and then perhaps in, in my case I eliminated a big cost of £240 a year on a membership in, um, in a thing called just a, like an industry association yeah. which I needed in the first second year because I, ha I felt safe with them all mm -hmm. the paperwork they provided all the paperwork um, you know legal advice all that sort of thing but then after the first two years I know how to do my paperwork, and you know what? I don't think I'm going to need legal advice, hmm. yep. um, really, because yep. it, you know it's not the nature of my business. Yep. I'm not prone to that. So, not so that, story. for example. I like what you said about the, the raising the, the profit margin. I feel like if you're quoting for new jobs, then one bit of advice I was given is if you put your prices up, just to see, you can always put them back down again. It's not set in stone forever and a day. So if, if for a month you put your prices up by 10% and all of a sudden you find that the customers are still coming through, still buying it, then you've got your extra 10%. However, if all of a sudden you're getting that, ooh, that's a bit much, then you can always take them back down. Special deal you know. for you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Special deal for you. So something to think about that, you know, you don't have to make that decision forever and ever and ever. You could, you could put the prices up, see how it goes. And, mm. you know. But I think, uh, the, the, the a key one about the different platforms to talk to people, um, LinkedIn is going to be a very powerful yeah. one for you because it's still, although people are claiming it's getting a bit more like Facebook for adults, etc., mm -hmm. it still is a really powerful tool of engagement with corporates and those who are trying yeah. to build particularly small to medium sized companies. So the Federation of Small Business talk about it being one of the best ways that people can engage. We had Jack Parsons here um, not too long ago talking about he's built up a whole business just by bombarding people yeah. on, on LinkedIn with, with targeted messages. Mm. Um, and the good thing about lots of those platforms, if you, you can kind of be kind of anonymous, although it's your brand you're pushing forward, but not too much you can engage with people all across the country without having to travel anywhere just to test the water. And for me, I've always said that sales is about the law of averages. You've got to keep asking, 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 mm -hmm. and not be worried about not getting the, the yes straight away. You might need to ask another 10 times before you get that yes. Mm -hmm. How many distributors did you have? Did you sell them to? Well, uh, or directly? So, so no, directly. Well, well, lots. Not but, 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 um, it, it is just a percentage of this game. Yeah. If when you're visiting shop, because I used to go walk around with yeah. a suitcase full of samples when we first <laughs> started off, and if your hit rate is one in five, you only visit four shops, you might not get an order. Mm -hmm. But if your hit rate is, is one in five and you visit ten shops, yeah. you get two orders. Yeah. And it is pretty simple. And I'm a crap salesman. You've no idea how bad I am at this. But I learned the harder you work in terms of, you know, my, hit rate, my brother's hit rate might have been three out of five, might yeah. have been one out of ten. Yeah. But it meant I had to visit 20 shops to get, to get those two orders. Yeah. So, so mm -hmm. it is really yeah. that. So just keep an eye on both sides. But yeah, exactly. The, 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 it's right, you're doing the very, the very diligent activity of keeping an eye and control of the cost. Because lots of people, and we had this conversation, at the beginning you, you're not sure of what's going out the door because you're just so excited about doing stuff. So you, the exercise is right. Once you've got the information, one I say get independent advice to see if they come up with the same conclusion you do. Um, don't pay for it, 
come and knock on the yeah. door and have a conversation with somebody <clears throat> because we're cutting costs and so it's good but then also see if on the other side if there's anything around some of the activity to get more people aware of what you're doing and then that will hopefully help with that conversation does that make sense yeah yeah good advice it, that. easier said than done obviously yeah. but at least as a starting point and i'm sure there are people in this very room now who will definitely be happy to look over and have a conversation. Um, I'm not looking at anyone in particular, but um, in the room we'll, we'll have a conversation and be able to assist with that. Yeah? Sure. Wicked. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, my friend. So I am starting up a social enterprise right now, and it's all about trying to get under 25 years involved in digital skills technology, mm -hmm. because we're unrepresented and connected them with jobs. The problem that I'm having at the moment, I'm still trying, I'm in the process of, you know, I want to change the world and like, save everybody, you know. Life is great. Um, but the problem that I'm having is people, so you mentioned earlier that you had a, a mentor earlier who was like telling you to rope, pull the ropes and then one of you was talking about you need someone who was like going to pull you in and like give you the heart. Kick, kick your ass, I thought, I think he said yes. Yeah. <laughs> but the problem is, in order to get that mentor, I'm pretty sure this is a question that's been asked before, it seems like you either have to get alone and you need to get a grant, you to be part of an organisation. Like, how do you get that ask from somebody who has experience to be like, like help me, like I'm trying to save the world, but I need to be refined and like you know have a little sprinkle on top. This guy. H have you started your business yet? We're in freelance, so we're launching in October. Uh, okay. Yeah. So yeah. So so uh, my my thing is um, you're you're the the best marketing vehicle for your business at this particular stage. So your enthusiasm and the way that you articulate it in a succinct way that gets people excited about it is an essential tool that you have. And you obviously have lots of energy and charisma. You've been talking lots because your voice is dying. And you obviously know great people because they used to work here. So, so you're, you're, you're not shy about coming forward. So you should be doing much more of this networking because you are going to meet or interact with somebody who buys into you. They buy into you. They think, Do you know what? You're a decent guy. And therefore, they'll be willing to give their time to offer you advice and guidance around different things. For us, as what ideas for us, we provide mentors with the businesses. So they come as a package, as it were. And we tend not to do social enterprises because we want, we, can only, we tend to support businesses that are purely commercial and looking to grow, etc. Although a business that creates employment is a social enterprise, in my humble opinion. But we won't get into the particulars. I'm presenting the Social Enterprise Awards tomorrow, so I'm a good guy. I'm not just a horrible, <laughs> horrible captain. Right? Um, I've atoned for my sins. But the, the, the thing for you is going to be to network with people and to use forums, I think, in terms of getting the advice and guidance you want because you'll have specific questions that you need help with. People say, I want a mentor. And actually, they actually sometimes they want an accountant or they want somebody in marketing, or they want somebody who can help them to, to put a pitch together. There are there's specific asks, and I think you need to go underneath the umbrella of mentor and then find out what do you actually need to get you from today to October. Because you've got a, you've got a burning platform now. You're, you're, you're pre-launched, it's quite cool, isn't it? Sounds quite cool. Um, but you're pre-launched, so therefore, what do you need to happen to make October a success. And there'll be different things that you need along that journey. Then you should be asking specific questions about those different things, yeah? Because a mentor, most people think about going down the pub, having a nice drink, having a nice conversation, etc. and that's cool, that's lovely. But you can do that with your mates, you can do it with your friends. You actually want somebody who's going to challenge you to be <coughs> better with, your, with their knowledge than you would be without their knowledge, yeah? Yeah. So, <coughs> find out the specific question that is keeping you up at night. So I'd always push back on the individual when they say they want a mentor. What, what, what for? Hmm. What do you want them for? And I'm not asking you now because you can think about that, but you should be able to articulate exactly what that mentor is going to deliver for you. Because we always talk about opportunity cost at Bright Ideas, and it's you could do anything, you could be doing anything, so there's a value to both of your time, yeah? If you don't know exactly what you want with your time, it's a waste. And you shouldn't be wasting your time. It's the most important commodity that we all have, yeah? So you should be very clear about what you need to help you to go to the next stage. And if you haven't, spend more time thinking about it. Spend more time thinking about it. Write it down. Try to work through to that point. We've got Luke and Robert, they're very clear about what they need. Um, they want to manage costs or make more money as we identified now. So it's ma manage costs or make more money. Very articulate, very clear. 
any one of the mentors in the room could go up to them and have a conversation about what they could do to help with either one of those, those, those issues. But to say I want a mentor, yeah, cool, I've met you now, what are we going to do? Hmm. But you feel, at, at first, you feel lost. And That's the right. support, I think, I think there's also a thing about support. Yeah. Where obviously it's sometimes you've got questions or sometimes you just feel like at the beginning you need someone to just, to just say, am I, am I doing this okay? Do you know, one thing I would say is, um, you said about value, I think that's the key word. What value can you bring to a mentor? Because you obviously bring a lot of value, but the fact that you're so enthusiastic, you're obviously smart, you've got loads of ideas. So this, uh, <laughs> this idea of, of bringing value and just saying, look. Glasses, glasses. <laughs> 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 no, in all seriousness, there's a fact, it's a fact. That if, you, if you take an Instagram picture, have it with glasses and a smile because the, the, the ratings of a person with glasses and smiling is higher than right. people without. It's a fact. So there is. We've done our rules. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I mean, is it all those times people ribbed you at glasses? Laugh at them now. <laughs> Seriously, it's a fact. Do you look at the, the, the biggest like, the profiles on Instagram um, or Twitter or anyone, you check the format of getting their picture. They're smiling with teeth. You like smiling with teeth, I can see yours. Um, and they put glasses on. They might not need them. But they put them on because people will assume that they're clever and intelligent. And they've got a background picture of them talking to many people because that's how you sell. You talk to many people. Listen, play the game. You've got to know the rules. Mm. The rules of engagement will make sure never. I'm going to wrap up because we want to get you talking and having food and, and wrapping up before um, our, ho our lovely host Steve kicks us out and makes a pay extra rent or something. But <laughs> he's, he's lovely. He wouldn't ever do that. But I hate <laughs> um, But I want you to think of a pearl of wisdom. Um, that you would leave the audience with. So something that you wish you were ever told yourself or you've learnt or you would like to pass on if you were going to do something again. Because we are here Brighton, so it's all about uh, passing on and adding value, hopefully, to, 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 to people. Um, as we've said, we want to work with people who want to start businesses, who need help in order to be able to do so. So if that's you, fantastic, let's have a conversation. We've got the beautiful team over here uh, from Bright Ideas Trust. Um, who will tell you, Catherine's up. Glasses. <laughs> Glasses, <laughs> smiling, white teeth, you can see it all over here, right? <laughs> Catherine is our, is our chief executive. Um, she's an absolute ninja. She's come over from Young Enterprise. Um, she, she, she's just brilliant. Um, we've got Joe and David. Um, who make sure that everything runs as it's according to and will into the business engagement, making sure that we get lots of more partners. They are, they are the dream team, do you see what I mean? I just do the tap dancing at the front. That's it. They, they throw me out, go on, tap dance, and they go, go home now, put me back in my box. But if you need any help or guidance around what we do around Bright Ideas Trust, come and find any of us. Um, but they're the brainy ones, they'll, they'll really know exactly what to do. Once again, there's mentors in the room. Um, we want to carry on the conversation. Um, use our hashtag, um, BIC2017. I got it right, I've been looking around, didn't I? What? <laughs> um, but our is our logo. Make sure you tag Marlon's Kitchen, you get Damon. Um, you can find you on all the different um, platforms, demo on all the different platforms. John's going to go stick around for a little bit, yes? Um, and have the conversation with us all. Pearl of Wisdom, where do I start? Um, somebody said, when, when's the best time to um, plant a tree? The best time to plant a tree 20 years ago. <laughs> and so at the last meeting somebody said when's the best time to start your own business and I said yesterday mm. so that's my pearl of wisdom love that, I love that my pearl of wisdom is you have time and I see in life people are so impatient because of society and the technology we have and if you think about leaving college at 20 and retiring at 70, even if you're 60, you've still got 10 years. If you're 40, you've still got 30 years. So play the long-term game as opposed to planning the next six months and trying to take over the world in the next six months. You have got more time than you think. Um, for me, it's two things. Um, not falling in love with your own ideas, so thinking on your feet. If, if you see that something's not working, drop it, so be committed, not attached, but also <coughs> have a crack at it. If you have some idea, don't let your fears hold you back, just just go for it. Mm. Obviously do it in a smart way, but if you don't try, you're not going to know. So, so lovely, <coughs> lovely. So start yesterday, you've got time, committed, not attached, that's so beautifully articulated. These are all um, things I've heard from my friends, well, mentors, mm. all the way, so it's, but now, that meant, now you've passed it on, and mm. that's the bit that's really important, we've passed it on. Um, 
So I'm not going to be committed or t- I'm going to not be attached but committed to finishing on time because we must be there. See you know what I did there, little tap dog? Um, <laughs> that's why he put me up on these silly chairs. But uh, So um, our next date uh, is up here. Uh, put in your diaries. Um, it will be different people, different speakers. <coughs> Unfortunately, you have to look at me again to, to guide you through the process. But we run them as regularly as we can. We'd love to see you at the next one. Um, put it out on your social media if you can. That will be our bit of advertising campaign. I don't see anyone's phones out. Where's your phone? Take pictures. <laughs> what's, what's going on? I saw one phone. Love it. Yes. Love it. Love it. Take the pictures. Get it out. Hashtag it out because otherwise you'll miss it. Um, but now it's just time to go and have drinks. How, how long have we got? Not very long. Ten minutes. We've got 10 minutes, so we don't get indigestion, <laughs> but go and get the rest of the food that's on the table so we don't waste it. Thanks very much for listening. Brilliant. Dude, always a pleasure. Thank you so much.